Let's take our Bibles and look in Jeremiah chapter 35. Lord willing, we'll read down through this entire chapter because it's all one narrative. Here it has to do with the lesson of the Rechabites. I don't know if you've ever heard about these, but the Lord willing, after we finish reading this, we'll know a little bit more about these that the Lord put to the test in the day of evil there in Jerusalem as he was going to bring judgment upon that city, upon that temple. So here in verses 1 and 2, it says, The word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, Go unto the house of the Rechabites, and speak unto them, and bring them into the house of the Lord, into one of the chambers, and give them wine to drink. Here it speaks of the days of Jehoiakim, this would have been after the days of Zedekiah that we saw already in the last chapter. So the chronology is a little bit difficult perhaps to follow here in that Zedekiah was the last of the kings. And yet we read here of the Lord telling Jeremiah to go speak in the days of Jehoiakim. It's almost as if he goes back to the Je days of Jehoiakim. But I believe that this would have been delivered during the reign of Zedekiah, but recalled the events of the days even prior to Zedekiah, the days of Jehoiakim. But here he says to go to the house of the Rechabites. We don't know much about the Rechabites other than what we read here, but apparently they were a very radical sect of Jews among the Israelites, radical in the sense that they had their own community and they had their own lifestyle, somewhat nomadic, and dwelt in the wilderness rather than in the cities. So this would not have been for them something customary for them even to go into the city. But here the Lord sends for them that they should come. If you go back to the days of Moses and Jethro, father-in-law of Moses, the descendants of Jethro came from this particular area in this wilderness of Judah toward the south. And these nomads that were in this area would have been likely ancestors of the father-in-law of Moses going all the way back to his day. But they had a particular leader, the Rechabites, that stood against the evils of the day, not only in lifestyle, but even in a form of worship that was free from the idolatry that was going on during the day, free from the corruptions, even during that time of King Ahab. And so this family, this group, these Rechabites would have not only been connected by family bonds, but they lived somewhat of an ascetic lifestyle. If we used our modern day terms, they might have been back in the 60s, somewhat like the hippies. Or even today, the Amish, where you go in and they have their own particular community. But these were Jews. And so here we find the Lord telling Jeremiah to send a word and bring them to the house of the Lord, that is the temple as it still stood and give them wine to drink. Now this would have been a particular commandment that went against what the Rechabites 
believed or held as far as their own practices. They didn't drink wine. But here the Lord says, give them wine to drink. And so in verses 3 through 5, Jeremiah does as God instructed him to do. It says here, then I took Jazaniah, the son of Jeremiah, the son of Habazaniah, and his brethren and all his sons and the whole house of the Rechabites, and I brought them into the house of the Lord into the chamber of the sons of Hanan, the son of Igdaliah, a man of God, which was by the chamber of the princes, which was above the chamber of Masiah, the son of Shalom, the keeper of the door. And I set before the sons of the house of the Rechabites pots full of wine and cups, and I said unto them, Drink ye wine. So when it says here the whole house of Rechabites, likely here would have been their representatives. And when it speaks here of coming into the chamber of the sons of Hanan, apparently at the time of Jeremiah, there were certain individuals that had claim to particular chambers. If you look at how the temple was built, there were different stories. And different ones had access to different chambers or rooms in the temple. And here, Hanan seems to be one of those who was a supporter of Jeremiah. In fact, here when it says Hanan, the son of Igdaliah, he's called a man of God. In the earlier times, a man of God, that applied typically to a prophet and not merely the great prophets. It's interesting that in certain parts of Africa, when I get letters from different ones who have heard me preaching, that's how they address me as man of God. That's how they've been taught down through the years. And so here in particular, when it says the son of Igdaliah, a man of God, this may well have been one of the sons of the prophets that Elijah and Elisha would have taught and uh, that he was actually the head of a group of these Rechabites that had his place there in the temple. But it says here that Jeremiah did exactly as the Lord told him to do. There are times where the commands of the Lord, even though they go against the practices of people, that some might hesitate, halt at wondering, well, because Jeremiah knew these Rechabites, they didn't drink wine. And yet he did not in any way try to reason or change their thinking. He just simply declared what the Lord had said to do. I believe when a preacher begins to look at the audience and look at different people and their different persuasions and customs and, and where they come from, all these things, and endeavors then to try to work around some of those things, that's where you get in trouble. Now we're to simply stand and declare the word of the Lord, and that's what Jeremiah did here. It says, I set before them, in verse 5, the sons of the house of the Rechabites, bowls full of wine and cups. So this would have been a test that the Lord was bringing through Jeremiah to these Rechabites. Notice, I set before the sons of the house of the Rechabites pots full of wine and cups, and I said unto them, Drink ye wine. The way this is written here in the original was that it would be like if someone offers you wine to drink during a meal and you just politely refuse, say, No, I don't drink wine. It wasn't a command. He wasn't commanding them in the name of the Lord to do this, but especially since he knew their, their commitment not to drink the wine. So the point of this test here was not to persuade them to do it against their conscience, but to publicly 
And I believe this is the whole purpose here. As we read on down through here, the Lord was demonstrating that here were some people with some persuasion that were bound together and nothing could deter them from that persuasion as opposed to all of these other Israelites of Judah that were following after every type of idolatry and had no persuasion whatsoever. I believe the Lord brought these Rechabites in to mark the difference between these who worshiped the Lord as he directed them, even in their customs, but would not bend. I think of Daniel there when he and his friends were brought before the king of Babylon. They would not eat the king's food. They requested food that they knew would not go against their conscience. And so I believe this is where the test is. It was the Lord setting this before them, knowing all the while that the Lord would strengthen them not to violate their persuasion. You know, that's how you can tell the difference between a preference and a persuasion. A preference is, well, I prefer to have this today, but tomorrow, I could always eat something else or drink something else. A persuasion, and I think here about this wine that to them represented something evil, and yet their persuasion was not to partake for whatever reason. This is how they were separated unto the Lord. Paul wrote about this in Romans chapter 14, that there are those that have a particular persuasion as to days and customs and other things, but we're not to look down the nose at them or think ourselves better because they do things differently than we do. And so here we find the Lord using the Rechabites, putting them to the test as an example to these others that given the slightest difference or preference, they would run after other gods. So in verses 6 through 11, that's where we see these Rechabites standing firm. They said, we will drink no wine for Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father commanded us, saying, ye shall drink no wine, neither ye nor your sons forever. Neither shall ye build a house nor sow seed, nor plant vineyard, nor have any, but all your days ye shall dwell in tents, that ye may live many days in the land where ye be strangers. Thus have we obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, in all that he hath charged us to drink no wine all our days, we, our wives, our sons, nor our daughters, nor to build houses for us to dwell in, Neither have we vineyard, nor field, nor seed. But we have dwelt in tents, and have obeyed and done according to all that Jonadab our father commanded us. And it came to pass when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up into the land that we said, Come and let us go to Jerusalem for fear of the army of the Chaldeans, and for fear of the army of the Syrians. So we dwell at Jerusalem. Typically, they would remain out in the wilderness, and yet, because of the changing scene, they went into Jerusalem for protection. But here we see where they declare their loyalty to the teachings of their spiritual father, Jonadab, that's mentioned here. The point here is not strictly speaking whether you should drink or not. That's not it. I know there are some that have that persuasion that they should never drink wine. And they feel like it goes against their conscience as Christians even to have any wine at all or partake. There's others, like again in Romans 14, that they don't see that as an issue. But this is not about drinking or not drinking wine. This has more to do with honoring Again, that persuasion that was theirs and not be moved from it. 
no matter what the circumstance. And so when this spiritual father, Jonadab, had given them that instruction and told his sons not to drink any wine and live pretty much a life of self-denial. There's sometimes we get so caught up in life that that sort of lifestyle might seem to be very appealing to some. Just get away from everything else and activity. I guess modern language, I've heard some say I need to go, go off the grid. Get off the grid. Just get away and not have all of this other influence of TV and phones and other things that are a distraction so that I can live a, a more pleasant life. If that's how the Lord directs some, then that's how he directs. But here they're saying that the only reason that they came to Jerusalem, as in verse 11, was out of fear of the army of the Chaldeans. The Rechabites were committed to that life as nomads and so had avoided houses and cities and lived in tents, yet here they were refugees. Necessity dictated that they should go and seek refuge in Jerusalem. And so what's the lesson? Well, verses 12 through 16, Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Go and tell the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Will ye not receive instruction to hearken to my word, saith the Lord? The words of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, that he commanded his sons not to drink wine, are performed. From to this day they drink none, but obey their father's commandment. Notwithstanding, I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but ye hearken not unto me. You see what the lesson the Lord's bringing here? Here's some that live this ascetic lifestyle, and they follow the instruction of their spiritual leader, and yet here I am, your God, and I've sent prophets rising up early and speaking, but ye hearken not unto me. So he's using these Rechabites really as a condemnation of these that profess to be following the Lord and yet did not obey the Lord, did not receive his instruction. So the whole purpose of this is the contrast between the Rechabites that were really following the instruction of a fallible leader and yet dedicated to that instruction, whereas the people of Judah would not hear the instruction of an eternal God. So if you took a piece of paper and kind of looked at some of these contrasts the Lord's making, this is what it is. The Rechabites received their commandment one time from their leader and obeyed down through the generations. That was their persuasion. But here the people of Judah, the Lord said he had risen up early speaking, ye hearken not unto me after many commandments of the Lord, again and again, still they disobeyed. So you can see how the Lord was using this to bring reproach upon the people of Judah. If the Rechabites, here's another way of looking at it, if the Rechabites obeyed concerning earthly things, because you're saying, well, what's the big deal about wine? Well, so they still had that persuasion and followed it, stayed together as a group. And yet here the people of Judah could not even hearken unto the Lord with regard to eternal things. So the contrast is between the physical, earthly, and the eternal. The Rechabites had followed their leader's commands at this point would have been over about 300 years. And yet during that same time period, not once could it be said that the people of Judah obeyed their God. How can that be? So you can see the, the reproach the Lord's bringing upon them here. And the Rechabites were blessed as a result of 
sticking with their persuasion, whereas the people of Judah would be judged. And so verse 17, or, or reading on down through here in verses 15 to 16, we'll read on, I have sent also unto you all my servants and prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Return ye now every man from his evil way, and it amend your doings, and go not after other gods to serve them. And ye shall dwell in the land which I have given you, given to you and your fathers, but ye have not inclined your ear, nor hearkened unto me. Here it is. Because the sons of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, have performed the commandment of their father, which he commanded them, but this people have not hearkened unto me. So what's the conclusion? Verse 17. Therefore, Remember, whenever you see the word therefore, what's therefore? Therefore, thus saith the Lord, the God, God of hosts, the God of Israel. Again, if these can follow after an earthly leader and a man with their persuasion, and yet here I am the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel. He says, behold, I will bring upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the evil that I have pronounce against them because I have spoken unto them but they have not heard and I have called unto them but they have not answered this is not God having a pity party when God speaks his word is to be obeyed and where it's not there are consequences some might argue well it's the Lord that's got to give the spirit for them to obey but it doesn't change the fact that he has spoken, and whether men hear or not, he will judge every disobedience, especially when it regards here going after idolatry, as he mentioned there in verse 15. Any other way that men pursue and seek other than that way that God has commanded to come unto him through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, there can only be judgment that will follow. So here again is the Lord even as Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians would soon be surrounding that city and destroying it. The Lord is reminding them as to why he's bringing that destruction. And so the last two verses here the Lord promises his blessing on the house of the Rechabites. This is not works salvation or God rewarding in any way because of some personal obedience. No, but he says, Jeremiah said unto the house of the Rechabites, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, because ye have obeyed the commandment of Jonadab your father, and kept all his precepts, and done according unto all that he hath commanded you. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab the son of Rechab, shall not want a man to stand before me forever. It's interesting. Here, their obedience to Jonadab is really a type and picture of the obedience that the Lord gives his true people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And here, Jonadab, when it says the son of Rechab would not lack a man to stand before me forever, you stop and think about how that could be fulfilled. That will not lack a man to stand before me forever. Who would be that man that would stand before God on their behalf? It would be the Lord Jesus Christ. And we find that this was literally fulfilled when it speaks there in verse 18 with the Rechabites being in some way incorporated into the tribe of Levi. But Jeremiah said unto the house of the Rechabites, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, because you have obeyed the commandment of John and of your father, and, and kept all his precepts, and done according to all that he hath commanded you. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, John and Ab, the son of Rechab, shall not want a man to stand before me forever. Well, who were those that were appointed to stand before the Lord. It was the Levites. It was the priests. And what the Lord is saying here is that 
he would incorporate these even among the Levites and that they would not lack a man. Jonadab was long dead and yet the Lord purposed to bless these through a man that he would raise up and that man is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ that the Lord would be their representative and uh, that even though these others would be carried away into captivity yet the Lord would always preserve a remnant among these as an example of what it is to be wholly committed unto Christ gracious Father thank you for your word and how profound it is I pray that even as we read it our hearts and minds would be turned toward that one man that you've established to stand before you forever to represent that people that you have chosen and given unto him and I thank you that we have your scripture, your, your word and pray that even as we continue our time of worship that our hearts truly would be toward your son the Lord Jesus Christ and your blessing to sinners such as we are in him. We give you the praise, honor, and glory in his precious name. Amen.